I'm delighted to say that we are going to be joined by the Director General uh, of the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, of course, a UN agency crucially important to uh, uh, the cooperative approach to farming, farm systems all over the world. He is a former Vice Minister of Agriculture in China. He brings vast experience of transforming China's agriculture to his current role at the FAO. So let's give a very warm welcome to Mr. Chu Dong Ju, who is joining us from Rome. Welcome, sir. Uh, I know you're going to give us your opening thoughts, and then I have the opportunity, and indeed everybody who's joining us on the platform here at FFA will have the opportunity to ask you a few questions. But I'm going to hand to you, and looking forward very much to hearing your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure to deliver the keynote address this morning, and I thank the forum for the invitation. I'm uh, with my very exciting, interested in listening to uh, Yannick and also SC's uh, uh, message just uh, delivered uh, minutes ago. We are at a critical moment in time as we observe the convergence of the facts that, if ignored, would prevent us from the uh, ending the global hunger and malnutrition in its all forms. The number of hunger people in the world have increased uh, during the last six years in a row. So that's even before pandemic. They already increased by 10 million in 2019 and nearly 60 million in the five years before that. It is estimated that by the end of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic added another 132 million to the number of the hunger people in the world. The child studying remains unacceptably high, and overweight and obesity continue to increase in rich and poor countries alike, especially in the city. Huh? More than 3 billion people in the world cannot afford even the cheapest health debt. The current consumption pattern and agro-food systems are contributing to this disturbingly high rate of the food waste and loss. Air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and the loss of biodiversity and constitute a growing source of inequality. This is uh, generating severe human, economic, and environmental costs that run into the trillions of dollars. To get to the where we need to be by 2030 and or beyond 2050, we urgently need to do some, something different and act holistically to transform our agri-food systems. We need to recognize the interconnected and compounding economic, social, and environmental impacts of our agri-food systems. There is a range of solution packages that would address hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition while ensuring affordable health deaths for all. Solutions that can also reduce the carbon footprint and ensure environmental sustainability. Policy solutions can be designed to be an engine of economic recovery, create a viable jobs and a sustainable livelihood, importantly addressing inequality. Holistic agri-food system solutions should be context specific and much needed to be done to identify these, but it is critical that we begin to do this and to do it at a scale. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2030 agenda has highlighted awareness of the key role that the future agri-food systems will play in facing the global challenges of malnutrition, poverty, the use of biodiversity and the ecosystem service and the climate change. The agenda is there to guide us, but historically consensus surrounding its adoption must be matched by a political determination and a commitment to deliver it. With many SDGs off track, the need to engage all actors at all levels with the systematic approach become more pressing. To achieve the ambitious transformative change required, 
We need a new dimension of collaboration, not only across the border, but also within the whole of society. We need to change our policies, mindset, behaviors, and a business model. That's four areas I said it's innovation. I fully agree with uh, 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 the chairman. Innovation is not only technology innovation. We need a policy innovation, mindset change, behavior change, and the business model change. The renewed, inclusive, and agile FL lead by example, taking advantage of digital technology and building bridges across the region and the continents with our members. We have 194 members and partners. Within European Union, our member organization for 30 years, we are continuing to strengthen collaboration on the transforming agri-food systems. Private sector is a key ally in the fight against hunger, providing innovative tools, resources, knowledge, and technologies to achieve transform transform transformative change on the ground. This is why FAO is spearheading a modern approach in our work with the private sector. We do so with our newly endorsed strategic, strategic for uh, private sector engagement. This is fully aligned with FAO commitment to support the members to achieve the SDGs by 2030. Dear colleagues, FAO strategic framework 2022 to 2031 seeks to support the 2030 agenda through the transformation to more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable agro-food systems for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, a better life, leaving no one behind. This four betters represent the guiding principle and innovative business model for how FAO intends to contribute to SDG 1, no poverty, SDG 2, zero hunger, and SDG 10, reducing inequalities, as well as to supporting the achievement of the broad SDG agenda. The four batters reflect the interconnected economic, social, and environment dimensions of agro-food systems. To accelerate progress and maximizing our efforts in meeting the SDGs and to realize our aspiration, FAO will apply four cross-cutting, cross-sectional accelerators in all our programmatic interventions. These accelerators are technology, innovation, data, and complements, which is governance, human capital, and institutions. Emerging technologies are already changing the food and agriculture sector, yet most governments or agri-food systems actors have yet to harness their powerful potential. Having farmers take full advantage of new technologies such as digital agriculture, biotechnology, process agriculture, innovation in agroecology, 5G, artificial intelligence, to increase food production, and also to increase the food biodiversity, food diversity, while respecting the environment is of paramount importance. Innovation in general, and in particular in agriculture, is a central driving force for achieving the world free from hunger and malnutrition because we will have a 10 billion population by 2050. Innovation and science increase social innovations, policy innovation, institutional innovation, financial innovations, technology innovations are important drivers that affect the food and agriculture production and the distribution processing and the consumption pattern. On data, FO geospatial platform and the data lab for st statistical innovation exemplify how big data on food, agriculture, social economics, and the natural resources can come together to help strengthen the evidence-based decision making in the food and the cultural sectors. This is exactly what we are doing in our hand in hand initiative to transform agri-food system of the least developed landlocked countries, least developed small island state, and food crisis countries, so that no one is left behind. Complements refer to the needed governance, human capital institutions to ensure an inclusive agri-food systems transformation. Trans transformative processes require strong, transparent, accountable institutions and governance 
include adaptive and effective regulatory governance. As technologies revolutionize the risk of unequal access, exclusion room, invest in investment in human capital buildings, as well as policy and regulations to minimize such risks are indispensable. To work together towards the inclusive, safe, and trust first digital technology in food and culture, we are building the international platform for digital food and culture which will be at the heart of the efforts to digitalize agriculture for achieving SDGs. Through dialogue, the platform will promote the coordination and the consensus among all stakeholders and enhance awareness on issues specifically to the digitalization of food and agriculture, provide the guidance and support the decision making. Momentum is building towards the United Nations Food Systems Summit to catalyzing global efforts for inclusive healthy agri-food systems. Our new strategic framework is well aligned with the process towards the summit, and we continue to provide us full support for its proprietary process. Members that are conveying national level dialogue are relying on FAO technical advice and assistance. And we look forward to co-hosting the UN Food Systems Summit uh, uh, pre-summit, Sunday, 2020 Sunday, and assistant the pre-summit in July at FL headquarters in Rome. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic is an astonishing wake-up call, wake up call on the fragility of our agricultural system and the resulting vulnerabilities. But it also provides us the opportunity to re-evaluate how we address the root causes of hunger, and build a resilience against a similar threat in the future. We are doing this through FAO's comprehensive COVID-19 response and recovery program. This program has enabled partners to leverage FAO's convening power, real-time data, early warning systems, and technical expertise to tackle the problems behind the trend and inequality in access to the food. Launched in July 2020 with a cooperative budget target of uh, 1.32 billion US dollars. Program has received about 238 million pledged and confirmed contribution as of the middle of February 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, challenge we face is enormous. We must transform agri-food system to provide a growing population with a health, affordable, and diversified food diets. We need to do so in a way that is economically profitable and environment friendly. We know that is achievable with innovation. We at FAO are ready to design big and take concrete action together with all our members and partners. Together, we can make our common vision of a hunger-free world a reality. Let's be a dreamers and a doers at the same time. And the, the work, the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you. All right. Well, Mr. Director General, thank you so much for those opening remarks. We must be dreamers and doers, you say, but you also focus on the scale of the problem. And it's interesting to me that you say that the number of people in the world who are going hungry is actually increasing year on year, and I think the figures are fairly startling that there could be by 2030 something like 850 million people on our planet who are living with the daily reality of hunger. So I want you to use for me some of your experience in China. 50 years ago, there were many tens of millions of people in China living with the reality of hunger, and today you've pretty much eliminated that problem. If anything, you have problems of overconsumption in terms of the dietary habits of some of your people. So learn the lessons with me of what China has done. What did you do right? And also maybe what did you do wrong in the transformation of your food system? Thank you, uh, your, your question. It's, uh, of course, it's, uh, you talk about it during the past the 50 years. It's quite a challenge for me to answer properly. But uh, since also, you said you are a farmer's son. Also, I'm a farmer's son. Yeah? I'm, you are, maybe you are the bigger farmer's son. 
I, I'm a small farmer's son. It's less than one hectare. Well, my, I my still dad's remember. Farm, my dad's farm was a little bigger. It wasn't very big, but it was, it was uh, let's say, more like 60 or 70 hectares. So that makes a big difference. You know, why did I ask you? Because I know in the world, 84% of our smallholder farmers less than three hectares in one family. Normally, we talk about the four people. But I come from an eight people family with less than one hectare. That time, you can imagine how harsh. I can say in 1960, 80% of the people in China are suffering from uh, some sort of the hunger or starvation even. And lesson learning, I think uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 review uh, and also uh, uh, to, to, to what a lesson we can learn. But first, I think, uh, uh, experience what we can share with you first is we need an enabling policy. During the past 50 years or 60 years or even 70 years, if you have not the proper enabling policy to support agriculture and food, that will be big difference result. That's also we have a lot of lesson learning in China in different provinces and even as a national policy. So thanks to the open policy now and all since uh, uh, 50 years ago. So first, their policy support innovation because we have very limited land. That time when I was a child is about one billion and the land is there, but how to improve efficiency of land without uh, uh, you know, environment uh, negative uh, impact. Only the solution is, uh, is innovation, technology innovation we start. Yeah, and, and also with uh, policy innovation. That's a two innovation. And you can see uh, I'm from the Hunan, it's very south. And thanks to the hybrid rice, which without any additional input of chemicals and others, and you can increase 30 to 50% of a year. So the Professor Yuan Longbin, it's, a, it's our god. You know, when I was a child, we can in the, had enough rice, yeah? First, and the second, uh, I think, is uh, investment. You need a political, strong political commitment to really have the farmers, especially smallholder farmers, because in China, 94 or 95% of farmers are smallholder farmers, less than one hectare, not internationally three hectare. Mm. So you need the investment for the, for the irrigation system, for the road, for the soil improvement, for you name it. And also, you see, my hometown is uh, about uh, 1,600 millimeter water rainfall. But during summer, about uh, 30 to 50 days, no rain. And then you have no second season if you don't have a reservoir, small reservoir. You have enough water in a year, but you don't have adequate water for next season. So you need a small investment on that for the reservoir to collect the flooding for the further use. So investment on the, on the infrastructure, not only a, a big in investment, and also you need all those. And uh, last but not the least, also you have to train, in the, train in the farmers to get adequate uh, training on the uh, technology, on the marketing information. And now it's com during the past 10 years, it's completely different because Chinese farmers they can access to the market by e-commerce. Every village get the broadband. It's a 4G. Right. So that's thanks to the uh, investment. So I think the lesson learning and experience, you know, on the, it's a two sides of the coin. You correct your <laughs> mistake and then you build up your <laughs> experience. So I think that's four aspects. In short, enabling policy, innovation, and the investment, and the capacity building or, or farmers training, a technology transfer. That's a four aspect I, I really benefit. And that's why also I, I encourage all the members also in Europe. I visit so many uh, countryside here before I come to Rome. Uh, also, you need a, that's a four aspect. Mr. Mr. Director <laughs> General, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there. That's a fascinating answer. And I'm glad you told us about your own personal experience. And what you seem to be saying is that ultimately, uh, we're all in this together. And in the Chinese example, from the very top of the 
party leadership in Beijing to the smallest farmer on his small holding out in the countryside, to the scientists, to the technologists, to the policy makers at every level. Everybody has to be coordinated together to make this food system work. And I get that. Now I want you to address a different form of this idea of us all being in this together. You sit in Rome now as the head of uh, a very important global agency, the Food and Agriculture Organization. You are in a very good position to judge whether the world right now has the kind of leadership which is capable of moving beyond, let us call them, national tensions, and we don't need to go into detail, but we know there are plenty of national and international tensions across the planet right now. Do we have the kind of leadership which is able to work together in a truly collaborative, cooperative way to address the global food system challenge? Be honest with me. As you sit there in Rome, do you really see the sort of collaboration and cooperation we need? Yeah, I would say I'm a, uh, first, uh, sir, I'm a, I'm a op optimistic. That's why I, I can grow up from a small uh, fry in the va small village, uh, a remote village in China to come to Rome. So people uh, should be having hope, yeah, from an internal hope. And also you get external support. And uh, that's two aspects. So I think thanks for that, thanks for God. <laughs> You said that, uh, and now the uh, SG uh, Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, he two years ago he 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 is uh, planning to uh, uh, have a convened the UN Food System Summit. It's indicate it's a political commitment, and uh, it's leadership addressing the food agro food systems. I said agro food system because of every food, every animal from land. Sometimes I say you have, you, you have a, from a green deal, green deal from a uh, fork to the, uh, uh, from the farmers to the fork, yeah? But I said from tillage to the table, from mati to the mouse, yeah? from boat to the bow, yeah? Because agriculture is covered fishery, covered the forest. So everything comes from mati, from soil, from tillage. We need all different levels of uh, political commitment. And the leadership started with the UN, multilateralism, and also we appreciated the collaboration with, uh, with the EU here, all the commissions related, not only Commission Agriculture and Rural Affairs and others, development, you name it. So I think if we can, all the key players, or G20, or G7, you name it. So that's, we should, uh, from the, Top to the down, and also we have to give the uh, you know promotion or, or energetic from the grassroots, from a village. That's a two from bottom to the up, and then it makes uh, beautiful uh, things happening. That's what I really want. That's why FAO, I think, is, since I come here as a DG, all the members from OECD and from developing uh, from G77 or from uh, all the regions, they support me. Because I build the inclusive FL, transparent FL, one FL. You, we have to build the solidarity, yeah? because the food is the basic human rights, having no any political difference. Only difference is how to address this issue, how to solve the food insecurity. I also have very good, strong support from the Holy Father, because we can talk on the humanity and the basic human rights. So I think with your big passion, with your big uh, clear-minded, uh, uh, then you can get all the uh, support that you need. That's what I really appreciate all the key players, all the, from farmers to the uh, leaders, the support of the mandate and the mission, that's because that's our common mission. Right. Common mission, and, and the key word you just used there is solidarity, but it's hard for people to feel solidarity if they are hungry. And we know that in certain parts of the world, hundreds of millions of people right now are experiencing hunger. 
And when they hear discussions like this one today at FFA, which focus very much on sustainability, on changing land management systems to ensure the planet is protected, they might be saying, well, all of that is fine, and you guys can afford to talk about all of that sustainability stuff because your bellies are full. You are not hungry. <laughs> so how do we ensure solidarity to, to make the richer parts of the world, the parts of the world where there is no hunger, take a responsibility for more equitable distribution of food to ensure that those who are currently going hungry no longer go hungry in the future. With COVID, we've seen it's been quite difficult for countries to truly work together to ensure that, for example, everybody gets vaccinated, not just their own nation state populations. So how can we ensure that when it comes to food, there is meaningful solidarity and planetary equity? That's why I said the uh, last uh, sentence, uh, we are, let us uh, be dreamers and doers and the walk the talk. That's why they, from day one, even before I come, I, I consulted more than 1,000 experts globally. And we come to the day one, hand-in-hand -hand initiative of FFL. And hand-in-hand -hand initiative, we started focus on the most vulnerable countries and the small island states, least developed countries, and the landlocked least developed countries, and some food crisis uh, uh, countries. And it's about the 50 yeah, countries. Because FFL, we have, I said, we have 194 members. It's the largest. UN professional organization, I should say. But if we look at the vulnerable people first, and that's how I appreciate, I bring this hand in hand issue, it's we, we want to change the business model from the donor country, who is not only OECD or European members, and also some countries like China, like uh, Turkey, or like uh, uh, Thailand, uh, and their middle or, or, or less middle income countries, they can become also donors, because they can have the recipient countries who need the most. So if we start with uh, address the most vulnerable people, because I was one of billions of vulnerable 50 years ago on this planet. I think that's build the solidarity that let them feel. And so we, we uh, put all my efforts first on the vulnerable. And then I established the first in UN system, uh, Office for small island state and a landlocked office. Yeah, special office to address that. So it's not only talking, we have a, it's have a systematic, holistic approach to address because without the vulnerable people to get rid of the poverty and hunger. And that's leave no one behind, it's just a beautiful slogan. Mm. So even within Europe, you have also vulnerable part. In the, even in the city, yeah? And you have a vital part. So that's what I think. We are not only working for the farmers, we are working for the, all the consumers. Right. All the human beings, our, it, our, our customers. Here, here's a thought for you. The, the, the UN, as you well know, is working toward a food system summit uh, later this year, just as there's going to be a, a big climate change summit later in the year in Glasgow. And the two issues really do go hand in hand because I think as the... Secretary General pointed out in his letter this morning, we, we still basically have a food system which contributes something like one third of all greenhouse gas emissions to the planet. So the, the two things are intimately connected. Just as now there is so much discussion of how to ensure that we cut, significantly cut carbon emissions by 2030 and even more by 2050, do we now have to start talking about a system uh, of food production across the world which punishes people for carbon intensive production and for things like deforestation and despoliation of the natural world? Do, do we have to get real about putting punishments in place for those who are not working to a more sustainable food system? <laughs> uh, you know, my colleague, yeah, that's, that's a data is coming from FL uh, expert published in Natural Food last month. Eh? 
uh, uh, the, during past the uh, 30 years, we observed the food system, agrophos contribute around one third. You are right. But if the uh, per capita for the basic need, like food, it's very little, yeah? Because the rice, the industry, and the able and contribute 74 eh? uh, 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 percent. So first, you know, economic tell us, the basic law of economic tell us, marginal utility. So we have started to, to address the uh, most the highest uh, marginal utility sector. That's one. It not means that we are not look at the food system seriously on the uh, uh, climate change and the carbon uh, emission, uh, grass, uh, uh, greenhouse uh, uh, gas emission. But uh, within different sector, we have a different uh, marginal utility if we take the action. Second, my role, now during the uh, past two years, we are now the talk about the agri-food systems. We have to take our role to address the issues which sector of the agriculture? Because agriculture includes crop, animals, fishery, forestry. Some part is a contributor for the carbon neutral, uh, and some part like forestry, and some part is, of course, we have to change, or, or we have to, uh, to modify it based on the uh, evidence and the science solution. So that's what uh, we, it's, it's balanced. Different countries, different members, they have a different priority. But we want to build a more consensus on that to ambition, ambition about action to address the carbon need. And from the agriculture sector, I said it so many times, huh? if you have time to uh, read my last month, I had a uh, public lecture with uh, Italia Academy. Yeah, it's online. Uh, so how to transform agriculture from strategy to action? We have to break down each crop, each commodity, and how to establish a neutral uh, uh, carbon emission, yeah? CO2 neutral. Yeah? So that's, that's a way uh, it's a scientific approach. Second, I think for Europe and for able, for rich people, we have first, first, uh, most should be reduce the food waste. Because you reduce the 1% of food waste, contribute more than 10% of environment uh, uh, gas emission. So you don't need them that much investment, but you just change the consumption pattern and also establish some kind of policy to stop or zero for the waste. That's, that's the most effective way to help the transform or reverse agri-food system. Last, not the least, I think all the rich or developed country have taken the responsibility to have the less developing countries they can start you know, with a more modern technology, gas neutral, best practice, and avoid some mistake you made during the past 100 years, and no polluted industry, what else? So that's, that's we share the real, the human, you know, our common fortune, our real share the small planet we have. So oh. it's a holistic way, not only look at the silos, of agro-food system or industry or able. We want, we want to build the holistic approach and each part play the role, yeah? That's the uh, way. Thank uh, you. Yeah, Director General, we're almost out of time. I just want to ask you one last question. I think it, it would only be right for us to reflect on the global pandemic that we have all lived through. And I, I don't want to get into a discussion of, of where it started or precisely how it started, but I think the message of the pandemic is clear that uh, as our world population rises and the pressures on the environment also increase and our relationship with the natural world because becomes ever more complex, there is a real danger that we are going to see more pandemics, more transference of disease, from the natural world to the human population. I just wonder whether you've learned lessons uh, and can tell us how you believe that we human beings can build more resilient food systems to cope with, let us face it, the reality of future pandemics. Yeah, that, 
that's I, I, I agree with you. It's very complicated to, you know, the issues when they talk about relationship between human being. We are basically biologically. I'm a biologist. Huh? I'm a genetist. If you look at the evolution of the human being, we are basically the animal. We are mama family. So once you made the mistake, don't blame animal. <laughs> we are intelligent mama animal. <laughs> so we have to prevent. We have to address the issues. How to to stop your be behavior is not so properly, and how to take serious action to protect the biodiversity, environment issues, and said in, improve the efficiency. You can use the less land, less water, produce enough food, and you reduce the food waste. And the lesson learned in pandemic, I think first we have to respect science. Your science is. Let the science speak first. Second, infected governance. No matter your big or small countries, or even your community, or if, like FAO, the day one, I took it very seriously. Huh? I asked my DDG, Lohan Thomas, to coordinate uh, see a, a crisis management team, look at all the issues. So we started preparing the issue. We respect science because we are scientists. Yeah? So I think uh, science, let science speak first. Effective governance, and third, be prepared ourselves, also based on science and, uh, and, and the policy. Because we are more and more having those kinds of, because it's, it, it's possible, right? Because simply, because more and more advanced the science, you will find the problem. And 200 years ago, people, when you die, you didn't know you are suffering from cancer, because you, simply you didn't know the cancer. But now the science tells you that's some kind of specific cancer. So, any virus, any fungus, any bacteria will be infect our life, and from production, from environment, from food, and from the health issues. That's our right. small village. Yeah. We are really small village now. <laughs> well, it, I have to say it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you, Mr. Director General. I thank you for joining us at this forum for the future of agriculture. Your voice is an important one and we will reflect very carefully on your experience and your insight. Thank you so much for joining us from Rome today. It's my pleasure. I needed your support. Yeah? I said food and agriculture organization is to address the basic human rights. Yeah. Yeah? That's if without the food, without the human being. Well, that's, that's absolutely true. So, ladies and gentlemen, there we have it, Mr. Chu Dong Ju there, who is, I think, uh, you'll all agree, an incredibly important voice to hear at this beginning uh, of a day of discussion on food system renewal, because he raised so many issues there, not just from his own personal experience, and it was fascinating to hear his beginnings on a very tiny small holding farm in China. So he brought the personal experience of what China has done in terms of its own food production transformation. But now, of course, he speaks as one of those key global leadership voices trying to ensure that there is a collaborative, cooperative approach to the future of our global food system. He obviously professionally has to sound optimistic that the world can be brought together and work together on some of these issues. But Mark, I think it's fair to say, uh, as you said earlier, th these are extraordinarily big challenges and it is uh, important, but it was also quite hard sometimes to remain optimistic. Well, qu quite right, Stephen. I mean, we've seen these interventions uh, down the years of the forum, and uh, I have to say, I think from my perspective, that was one of the most impressive and compelling and upbeat messages that we've heard at the beginning of one of these conferences. Uh, hard not to be inspired by it. As you say, there's, a, there's something of a translation between the optimistic message and making sure that happens on the ground. But, um, but certainly his enthusiasm and optimism was, uh, was certainly infectious. I, and I'll tell you what, you know, I, I, in my day job on the BBC hard talk show, I talk to a lot of people in positions uh, like his, you know, global leadership positions. Sometimes they're really rather bland and anodyne mm. and don't say very much. But I, I, I did think that that was an extremely engaging and personal performance. And it, it gives you hope that, that this year of food systems summit, big UN declarations and rhetoric might just be more than the usual talk.